Our gospel is from Mark chapter 4, beginning with the 26th verse. Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But then the grain is ripe, and at once he goes in with the sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, and what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the air may make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The word of God for us, the people of God, thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Sweep over us, we pray. Move through us, we pray. Leave the meditations in our hearts and minds. May they be acceptable in your sight. Come, Holy Spirit, come. As we seek to be your church. Come, we pray this day. Amen. As we read the Gospels, we have a good understanding that the ministry of Jesus started rather small. We read the gospel stories of him going along the Sea of Galilee, calling a few fishermen, and not only the few fishermen, but following that, there was a tax collector he called and a zealot. They were not exactly the pick of the litter or the cream of the crop type folk. I can't imagine that any of them were voted most likely to succeed in the high school where they attended. Who were they? They were ordinary people called to an extraordinary life. But in order for them to live into that extraordinary life, that extraordinary calling, they had to spend time with the one who called them, Jesus. So that one day, and after a significant period of time, they could do the very things that Jesus had called them to do. One doesn't have to be in church for any length of time to know that there were 12 disciples who followed Jesus For three years, a small group watched what he did. They saw saw how he related to church, well, not church folk, but religious people, but also those who were not very religious. They observed how he went up to the mountain to pray and then down to serve and meet people where they were. And during this time, what were they doing? Well, they were being disciples, and disciples are students. They're learning from this great teacher. They are learning. They're growing. And over time, they're being transformed by the love, the grace, and should we say the patience of Jesus. In addition to the 12 disciples, there were women who, though not accounted among the 12, were definitely present at times as Jesus went from place to place. And what were they doing? They were watching and learning from this Jesus. The first witness we have of the resurrection, the first telling of the ultimate good news is of Mary. So she had to be among those who were following Jesus. And so we have 12 disciples, many of whom we don't know a whole lot about. And we have these women who are following him. To say that the beginning of this movement was small and humble would be an understatement. And yet here we are. And we're still talking about this Jesus. We're talking about the way of discipleship. We're talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And today we still see people called to be disciples, called to be transformed by the love, the grace, the mercy, and the patience of Jesus Christ. Jesus taught them about kingdom living. And when describing what the kingdom of God is like in today's parables, Jesus used seeds. I, I don't think Jesus could come up with a smaller object to describe the kingdom of God and what the kingdom of God is like. In that first short story, we, we hear him say the kingdom of God is like seeds scattered on the earth or on the ground. And the second one, 
It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Small seeds and kingdoms don't seem to go all that well together. When we think of kingdoms, what do we think of? We, we think of that which is large, vast, strong, and sturdy. We, we think of, of ruling with power and might. We, we sometimes think that kingdoms expand not by love, but by, by force, by taking over. The kingdom of God... It's like Jesus calling a few disciples who would drop everything to follow him and they would clash with the religious powers that be and with the Roman Empire. The Roman, if you will, kingdom. This kingdom of God set against the backdrop of the Roman Empire seems not just small, but rather insignificant, especially when we're talking about a few people next to the religious elite who were controlling with thousands upon thousands of Roman soldiers, thousands and thousands of soldiers called legions, that sounds not just impressive, but oppressive. Do the math, and it sounds absurd. And yet here we are. Here we are 2,000 years later, and we're still talking about Jesus. The mighty Roman Empire came to an end in the 5th century. And like seeds planted into the earth and rising up from the earth to a new form, a new life, we still see lives being transformed by the love and the grace and the mercy, the forgiveness of Jesus. Jesus started with 12 disciples and there appeared to be some growth along the way, along that journey. Because when we get to Luke chapter 10, a different gospel, we get to that chapter and Jesus is not just sending 12 out the disciples two by two. He's sending now 70 or 72, depending on which manuscript we might use. And he sent them out to villages where he planned to go. And we read that he sends them out like lambs in the midst of wolves. That sounds like a marvelous time. It doesn't sound like an easy mission at all. It sounds like Jesus was setting them up to fail. Only we read that they came back with great joy. Transformation had to have taken before they went out on that journey. Transformation had to have been taking place because the disciples report back, even the demons submitted to us. Whereas before they weren't all that effective. They were jealous of others who were doing ministry in the name of Jesus. So let's not go with the 70. Let's just go a little bit higher number, 72. And even that's not a large number of people. I'm not sure what the threshold is now, but when I started in ministry, a church needed to have an average attendance of 70 people to be considered large enough to sustain having a full-time pastor. 12 people to 70. It still doesn't seem like explosive growth, or even sustainable growth. And yet here we are, 2,000 years later, later, and pastors are still preaching about Jesus and the kingdom of God, and people are still answering the call to live as disciples. Now, some people might read the Gospels and come away unimpressed that the one that God sent into the world didn't have that much of a following before he ascended into heaven. Now, sure, there were crowds who came out to see and hear Jesus as he went from place to place. Today's parables were told not just for the 12 disciples, but to a large gathering. So large was this gathering that Jesus had to get out in a boat and to be able to go out a little bit and then see all who were there on the hillside to tell these stories, to tell these parables. So yes, there were crowds that went where Jesus went. But crowds do not equate with disciples. Just like Easter Sunday and Christmas Eve, the crowds reveal the potential of what can be for a church. But it's not the reality of a church filled with disciples. Just because there were many people there that day did not mean that they were all in, ready to go where Jesus was calling them to go and do the very things that Jesus was calling them to do. 
Many in the crowds were there to see what this fuss was all about, to see who this Jesus was. They wanted something, perhaps from Jesus. Maybe they went for personal reasons, for personal gain. They wanted a healing or they wanted to experience the miracle, if not for themselves, if someone in, with their family or a friend that they wanted to bring, that Jesus might reach out and touch them. I guess it could have been tempting to give the crowds who'd come out what they wanted. You know, to keep the numbers up. But that wasn't the way of Jesus. And grace was freely given to all in the crowds that day and to all in the church today. But when we receive the grace of God, we, we are called not to be neutral. There's got to be a yes or a no. We are called to respond in, in faith, in love, to be able to die to self and be raised to new life, a transformed life, transformed by the love of Jesus. And this transformed life doesn't happen because we will it or because we want it. It doesn't happen in a moment, but it happens over time. Many times a significant amount of time, if not for some a lifetime. It may start with good intentions, but good intentions don't get us very far without taking the next steps and daily being open to what God would have us do as a church, but also what God wants to do in each and every one of us. Yet we might count up the cost. And we might see that the inherent demands outweigh what God is calling us to do. And so like many in the crowds that day, we, we see people decide by their actions that the life of discipleship is not the life they want to live. It's not for them, even though they might hear and see all the things that Jesus can do and experience what Jesus has to offer in forgiveness and love and mercy and grace and might experience the taste of joy and peace but want to stop there and not experience the abundance of joy or that peace that surpasses all understanding. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was martyred for his faith, once said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come to die. And what was it that Jesus said to the crowds? What was it that Jesus said to people who were interested from a distance? To these would-be followers. Take up your cross and deny self and follow me. And to others, he said, give away all your possessions and follow me. To others, he said, your love for me must be greater than the love for your family if you're going to be one of my disciples. No wonder the crowds of people did not equate with the number of disciples. This call to discipleship, it's not a crowd pleaser. And with such demands, many of the crowds grew dispersed and, and others grew angry or, or disappointed. So angry were they at what Jesus was calling them to do that they found themselves in a different crowd there in Jerusalem shouting, crucify, crucify him. As I think about those days of Jesus walking with those disciples and teaching them and and growing, if you will, this new way. Jesus is not exactly a model for growth in the modern church. I mean, can you see Jesus applying for John to serve as a lead pastor of a local church today? Under skills and talents, he could write, I bring good news to the poor. Not only do I proclaim release to the captives, but have healed people from many a disease and have the ability to drive out demons. The blind have been known to see, and the oppressed are free after words spoken or a gentle, kind touch. Sounds great and wonderful. That's the mission he fulfilled in life. But then it gets to the interview portion of the time, and he's asked, how has the church grown under your leadership? And he answers, 
Well, I started out with 12. And after three years, got all the way up to 120. And when I left to go to heaven and the Holy Spirit came down, it went from 120 to 3,000 people on the day I wasn't there. But we know he was. Because the Holy Spirit was there. See, most boards interviewing Jesus wouldn't hire him, deeming him as incapable of growing a church. No board or council would entrust a mega church or a large church, for that matter, to someone with his track record. And what would be the reason he wouldn't be hired? He spends too much time with just a few people instead of pleasing the masses and giving them what we want. Dreams are too small when we want explosive growth. And yet here we are, 2,000 years later, and I'm not only preaching about Jesus, but you have carved out your morning on this Sunday to worship our Lord, to once again gather around the stories that Jesus told about the kingdom of God and how we are in it. What are we taught early in life? We're taught to dream big. Finish the sentence, go big or go home. People flock to the big cities, the more opportunities. Drive through D.C. and you will see a share of large stone buildings, one right after the other. They take up entire blocks. And when people from around the world go to that city, what are we telling them just by all the buildings? We are strong. We are powerful. Don't mess with this kingdom. The skyline of Manhattan reveals a similar story, only it's a story of opulence and wealth and riches. Today's homes are much bigger than they need to be, much bigger than they were 50 years ago, which just means... Greater the debt or more rooms to clean. Big churches. Let's have big churches because they can offer more than smaller ones in terms of programming and opportunities. And yet the size of the church doesn't make a church better. The larger a church becomes, it's more crucial to dream small to focus on small groups where people can connect with one another and encourage each other to connect with God and hold each other accountable so that over time we're not lost in the crowd. We are connecting with one another and encouraging others to grow in the way of Jesus with the understanding that transformation takes time. We need each other as we seek to be church. See, the parables that Jesus taught are not to encourage us to think about explosive growth, but about how we each are called to grow spiritually, inwardly, and to being the people that God is calling us and loving us to be. Margaret Mead said, Never underestimate the ability of a small group of committed individuals to change the world. And isn't that what we see in the Galilean rabbi taking time to invest in a few people who would eventually take the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth over time all the way to Chesapeake and they crossed the great bridge. I don't know about you, but when I came here the first time, I was greatly disappointed about the great bridge. Indeed, the kingdom of God is like Jesus calling a few people who are willing to learn from him and be transformed from fishermen to fishers of people and do that over and over again. The kingdom of God is like a few small seeds scattered upon the earth and the seeds transformed not by their own self-will and determination but because they were planted 
In the Gospel of John, we don't have parables, but we have another story that Jesus tells. Or not a story, but a saying. He says, very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and does what? Dies. It remains just a single grain. But if it's buried into the earth, it dies. It bears much fruit. The kingdom of God is like people willing to die to self and being raised with Christ, which is only something God can do in each and every one of us and through us. And this happens over and over again, year after year, as we seek to be the church that God is calling us to be here at Great Bridge United Methodist Church. A community of believers in our vision says that will be disciples. See, we have to be disciples first until we get to the second part so that no one misses out on the grace of God. That second part's not going to happen unless we are disciples first. I have some books on my shelf written by church consultants and books that are in the series called Go Big. Lead your church to explosive, explosive growth. When I read that title, I'm like all in. I'm going to get that book. I'm going to get the whole series. And I'm going to read about it, and we're going to do that in the church I was serving. Go big. I've read many books on church growth that tell us that our prayers aren't big enough. They're not audacious enough. One subtitle in a book says, Things start happening when you start praying big. Under that subtitle reads the following. You have to start praying crazy big prayers. Like God help us to do more than we've ever done. I like that part. God, would you just double our church in the next year? God, help me begin to see our church twice the size it is today. Help me see our church four times the size it is today. Help us to start acting like a church twice the size it is today so that one day we become that church. God, help us to bring Christ to our entire city. Now, I'm not opposed at all of asking God to come and help. Help us bring Christ to our entire city. After all, what do we as United Methods do? We see all the world as our parents so that when we disperse from this place, we're all seeking to be disciples and we're sharing the love of Jesus in word, sign, and deed. So yes, go. Dream big in that way. Live in the understanding that all the world is our parish. Carry the light and the love of Christ out from this place. Are we not encouraged to see where God is at work in the city and go and set up shop there? It's not that every time we leave here, we're taking God out in the world. God is already there, and we simply have to listen and be aware and partner with God in that awesome work. For us to experience any kind of growth numerically or spiritually, we truly need God. But even in dreaming small, we still still need God to experience the kingdom of God breaking through us. For transformation to take place in our lives and the life of the church, we truly need God instead of going after the next big thing, the, the next book to read, the next program to implement, the next new shiny thing that guarantees explosive growth in the life of a church. Growing as disciples of Jesus Christ where we love like Jesus and do what Jesus is calling us to do requires us simply to die to self, to yield, to leave behind the agendas and to let go of trying to control others and trying to limit the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit might lead us to be uncomfortable. You know, when we really think about it, or when I think about it, I don't want to be in ministry if we only do what we're capable of doing with who we are, with our skills and talents. I don't want to be in ministry if we're simply just trying to keep up with traditions and do what has always brought success in the past and just keep doing like that. Yet I know of me, I, I, I like structure, I, I like knowing expectations and my place in life for the church. But ministry isn't about me and my likes and my preferences, my influence, my control. 
Sadly, over the span of ministry, I think I've cast as many limits and created opportunities for people to connect with God. Short-circuited growth and discipleship and being too busy trying to appease the masses and the leaders in Richmond. Looking for that next big capital campaign that will bring success to our local church while overlooking people who want God. Who come longing for God. Longing to connect for healing, for community, for longing to be seen and, and loved. Longing to hear about how God cares deeply for them, for you and for me, and how God is able to meet each of us right where we are. Maybe that's where our focus needs to be. The sound system agrees. The kingdom of God is like people who gather for worship at Great Bridge United Methodist Church. And like seeds being planted, we are willing to die, to be changed, to be raised to new life. And as this happens over time, Sunday after Sunday, through small groups and through studies, through worship and serving, as we experience more and more of the love and the grace and forgiveness and the peace of Jesus, more and more people will want to come and experience what we are experiencing. And that's an incredible and abundant life of joy as we seek to grow in Christ. May it be so. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.